webinars are made possible thanks to generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website, autism.org. Now, before we get started, I will introduce our speaker. Dr. Jennifer Frankovich is a clinical professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Division of Allergy, Immunology, Rheumatology at Stanford University, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Her clinical expertise is in systemic inflammatory and autoimmune diseases that co-occur with psychiatric symptoms. In addition to generating clinical data to better understand the pan's illness, she is collaborating with 10 basic science labs who aim to understand the immunological underpinnings of the illness. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Frankovich. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and I'm grateful for this opportunity. Um, I am a rheumatologist. I'm not an autism specialist, um, but I, as you mentioned, I'm very interested in this overlap between um, inflammatory diseases and rheumatologic diseases um, that overlap with psychiatric diseases like OCD. Um, so I hope some of the um, rheumatologic um, insights that I'll provide today can be helpful to clinicians um, managing kids with um, autism who've had a mental health deterioration. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank um, all of the uh, people who have donated to our research program, um, including uh, Tara and Dave Dollinger, um, the PANS Pandas Physician Network, the Neuroimmune Organization, um, the NIMH Developmental Pediatrics Branch, Caldwell Children's Fund, the Global Lyme Foundation, and many grateful families. Um, so over the last probably two decades now, um, more and more rheumatologists are realizing this uh, link between um, rheumatologic um, diseases and disease exacerbations and mental health impairments. So what happens to a child with autism who develops a rheumatologic disease? Um, just like any child, a child with autism may develop an autoimmune disease and they may even just have subtle signs of autism that become more prominent when they develop an autoimmune disease. Um, and some autoimmune diseases may actually be more prevalent among kids with autism um, compared to their counterparts. So today I will talk about classic rheumatologic diseases and PANS um, that are associated with psychiatric symptoms, primarily OCD. And I'm hopeful um, that this will help um, clinicians and parents, um, again, who have a child that have ha has had a mental health deterioration. So these are the inflammatory diseases um, that have um, comorbid psychiatric symptoms. Um, so small vessel vasculitis, and I'll talk about a little bit about um, some of these. Um, we have the vasculitity, so inflammation of blood vessels in the brain. Um, there's diffuse inflammatory conditions of the brain that would include things like lupus and encephalitis, um, including, I'm not gonna talk about NMDA receptor encephalitis or Hashimoto's encephalitis, um, because I think that's more in the realm of neurologists as opposed to rheumatologists, um, but this can present as psychiatric symptoms. Um, basal ganglia encephalitis or inflammation of the basal ganglia, um, which includes diseases like Sydenham's chorea, which probably has overlap with pandas and pans, as well as postmycoplasma basal ganglia encephalitis. And there are systemic inflammatory diseases like Bichette's that can also present with basal ganglia inflammation. And there's a whole host of um, rheumatologic and inflammatory conditions that are associated with psychiatric symptoms, but we don't exactly know the mechanism. So lupus is the most common um, multi-system inflammatory disease that can affect the brain. And interestingly, OCD, which I know can affect kids with autism, um, is also more common in patients with lupus. Lupus is very rare in kids. Um, but I think there's a lot that we can learn. Um, for example, lupus patients have arthritis, small vessel vasculitis, high immune complexes, activation of the complement cascade, so you can, and then therefore lowering complements like C3 and C4, 
And lupus patients also have a low C4 gene copy number. So initially, when I started off as a rheumatologist, I was interested in lupus. And then as I moved into the PANS field, I decided to look for these things in our PANS patients. And lo and behold, we do see a lot of the same features that we do that um, is in lupus, which has helped inform treatment of some of our cases. So just like with a lot of inflammatory brain diseases, the routine MRI and cerebral spinal fluid is normal, uh, or there's nonspecific findings. So the, the finding of a normal MRI or normal CSF doesn't mean that inflammation is not happening. Bichette's sy syndrome is another multi-system inflammatory disease that can affect the brain. Again, this is rare in children, but in a child with a neuropsych deterioration um, and also some of these other findings, it might be something that you should consider looking into. Um, the key feature is recurrent oral ulcers. Oral ulcers are seen in other diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, um, but genital ulcers um, are um, sort of more um, pathognomonic for Bichette's disease. These patients can also have ocular inflammation, but it can be silent. So in a kid with recurrent oral ulcers and maybe genital ulcers, we'll actually send them to the, an ophthalmologist to look for the eye inflammation. The arthritis that occurs during flares is really short-lived and subtle. Um, these kids can get a lot of different types of rashes, but pseudofolliculitis is very common. Um, GI involvement um, can look like inflammatory bowel disease. Um, but the ulcers tend to localize to the ileal cecal region. Um, vascular inflammation is, is really at the hallmark of this disease. And this is the only rheumatologic disease that causes inflammation in both arteries and veins. Um, if we suspect this disease, one of the things that we look for is a particular HLA um, or a couple of HLAs, but then also we look for this condition called pathergy, where the child would get a blister at the site of the blood draw um, up to 48 hours later. So when we, when we get blood draws on our patients, we often ask the parents, look for a blister, set your, your phone um, alarm for 48 hours later and look for a blister, because this can be a clue for this disease. Um, so in Bichette's, um, the primary uh, symptoms are headaches, behavior changes, and cognitive dysfunction. Some patients will look more encephalopathic or have seizures. Some may have psychosis. Um, and really the deficits reflect on what is the underlying disease of the brain. Is it affecting the blood vessels? Is it is affecting the parenchyma? It can also affect um, the brain stem. Um, and the kids with midbrain disease tend to be highly as, um, sensitive to psychiatric meds. So if the child is having a really unusual response um, to psychiatric meds, we might uh, look more carefully in the midbrain area. Um, the MRI um, at the, acute, the time of the, acute, of the, it's not necessarily an acute deterioration, but early in the deterioration, if an MRI is obtained, you can see evidence of the inflammation. But in the more chronic phase, um, where the injury has already happened, um, it's more difficult to appreciate any changes, and you might just see areas of atrophy. Although, since every brain is different, it's hard to um, really appreciate the atrophy in individual cases. Um, in the beginning of a deterioration, um, the CSF can show increased protein and cells, um, and neutrophils may predominate. And then on pathology, you see periventricular, uh, uh, peri, sorry, perivenular lymphocytic cuffing. So again, inflammation around venules. And progressive personality change, psychiatric disorders, and dementia may eventually uh, ensue. Um, so the other thing we see in Bichette's is um, blood clots because of the inflammation in the blood vessels. So dural vein thrombosis is something that can cause headaches, um, papilledema, and sixth nerve palsy. So in a kid um, with recurrent oral ulcers um, and you know, new onset severe headaches, this is something that we think about. Shogun syndrome. Um, primarily affects middle-aged women and causes dry eye and dry mouth. Um, but we've had a few cases um, through the years of um, childhood onset Sjogren's, and you can see um, neuropsychiatric symptoms from that, primarily autonomic nervous system dysfunction. Scleroderma is, that, again, very um, rare, 
um, and it takes years to evolve, but children can present with Raynaud's abdominal, um, abnormal nail fold um, ca uh, capillaries. So you can see that, you know, in this is a normal capillary right here, but you can see these blood vessels are slightly enlarged and engorged. Um, this is sort of a classic finding for scleroderma and also a lot of other rheumatologic diseases. And you see this at the, um, the periungual region of the nail. Um, and we do see increased psychiatric symptoms among patients with scleroderma. I would say spondylar arthritis is the most common um, arthritis I see in kids with um, mental health deteriorations. Um, there hasn't been any systematic studies looking at children, um, but there has been in adults. 40% um, of adults with this condition have depression and anxiety. You can also see increased OCD and anger hostility. Um, this, pay, this condition presents with back pain and stiffness in the morning and with prolonged stationary positions. Um, and it's, it's um, highly heritable. So if we have a patient that has OCD um, and irritability, and there's a parent that describes a lot of back pain and stiffness in the morning or after they're sitting still for a long period. This is something that we will consider and we'll order an HLA B27. Um, I'm not a, um, an inflammatory bowel disease expert, um, but we do see an increased burden of psychiatric disorders in inflammatory bowel disease. And there's a lot of um, overlap between inflammatory bowel disease and uh, certain types of childhood arthritis. So this is how I've encountered it. Um, and patients with inflammatory bowel disease do have a higher rate of depression, anxiety, bipolar, and schizophrenia. Psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis also has an overlap with bipolar depression and anxiety. The arthritis is often dry, so you can't see it. You don't see pain and swelling and redness like you do in other forms of arthritis. And the pain can be out of proportion to the physical exam findings. Um, but the psychiatric symptoms may either amplify, so it may look like the kid has some pain amplification syndrome, or it can distract from the pain sy symptoms. And I see this more in the kids with autism where they don't really articulate that they have pain, but they're just irritable. Um, so in a family, and this is also very heritable. So if there's a first degree family member with psoriasis um, and I have a kid with a mental health deterioration, um, especially if the kid is highly irritable, um, I'll often get a, an ultrasound um, of their feet, since this is where we see it most in our PANS clinic, um, to look for this type of arthritis. So this is, um, so CNS vasculitis can also present um, with behavior changes and new onset headaches. Uh, this diagnosis is, is, you know, fairly easy to make on MRI because you can see um, evidence of the inflammation of the blood vessels and white matter changes in the um, brain imaging. Sydenham's chorea um, has, you know, was described hundreds of years ago and is, is, you know, the strep strains are still around. So this is something we still need to be aware of. Um, the, it is composed of three um, parts, emotional liability and psychiatric changes, hypotonia, so primarily the trunk, um, and chorea. And Korea's uh, involuntary, brief, random, irregular movements of the limbs and face, uh, and face, and it can look like continuous restlessness. OCD is very common in Sydenham's Korea, um, and um, so is irritability, emotional liability, um, easy crying or inappropriate laughing. These patients have um, outbursts of inappropriate behavior, irrational fears. Um, they're described as overly sensitive, mercurial, or abusive. Um, parents all, often describe these children as going undergoing a personality change and night terrors are also common, sorry. Um, and OCD at the is diagnosed at the time of Sydenham's Korea in about 60% of patients and about 100% of patients at relapse. So big overlap between OCD and Sydenham's Korea. Um, this was a 1926 article um, that describes emotional ability as being so the most common um, observation in kids with Sydenham's Korea. 
So kids who are previous to onset of career were quiet and manageable, suddenly become restless, irritable, extremely sensitive, and abusive. So the psychiatric symptoms can start two to four weeks before the CREA, and this led to um, led Su Susan Sweeto to hypothesize that maybe um, just abrupt onset OCD is a form frust of Sydenham's CREA, and then she developed the PANDAS criteria based on that hypothesis. Um, and the CREA can also be very subtle or masked. Um, so the kids often know they're making funny movements, so they may um, mask that movement. So clinicians must actively look for Korea on sitting and standing Romberg. Also feel for a milkmaid grip, um, a darting tongue, or wormy and tongue movements. And if you just Google Sydenham's Korea YouTube, um, there's some really great um, videos of the Korea, um, and you can appreciate how subtle it can be in some cases. So I think that it is often overlooked. So other findings, as I mentioned, truncal hypotonia, difficulty holding the arms overhead. And then some kids, not very common, but have hyperactive reflexes or hung up reflexes. The onset of chorea can be many months after the strep infection. So looking for strep at that time is not helpful and the strep uh, tests can be negative. Um, other manifestations of acute rheumatic fever are supportive, but not necessary for the diagnosis. So um, the, uh, the presence of Sydenham's chorea does not have to go along with heart disease. Oftentimes we do um, find a history of migratory arthritis. And once we make the parents aware of this migratory arthritis, um, then with future episodes, they are able to appreciate it. These patients can also have subcutaneous nodules and erythema marginatum, and I'm going to show you that rash. Um, so mild cases of Sydenham's chorea without other manifestations may be mistakenly ascribed to for behavior disorders, emotional disorders, restlessness, and clumsiness. Um, so this um, researcher, Dr. Stoleman, was very concerned uh, that, that mild cases of Sydenham's chorea, um, meaning the chorea was mild, but maybe the emotional symptoms were high, is getting missed in our, in our system. So here's the erythema marginatum rash. This rash um, is typically not present until the, the trunk is warmed. So I always ask parents to um, look for this rash um, after a hot bath. Um, or if the patient is hospitalized, we'll put warm blankets over the child and then see if we can bring this rash out. Um, so even in the absence of chorea, there's um, been epidemiologic studies linking strep throat infections uh, to mental disorders, in particular OCD and tick disorders. So in kids um, with an, an acute exacerbation of OCD and ticks, we're often just screening the child and the family members um, looking for strep. This was a study done by Tanya Murphy and she looked at kids in line for a throat swab um, and, and the, the raters were blinded. And she did also show a high correlation between positive uh, strep throat culture and the presence of ticks, movements and problem behaviors. And this was a study by Jay Geed showing that the basal ganglia volume um, was increased in the uh, new onset or acute first episode Sydenham's chorea compared to the control. So here you can see the volume of the caudate is bigger than controls, the volume of the putamen bigger than controls, and the globus pallidus bigger than controls. If you take any individual case, you may not appreciate the swelling in the basal ganglia. It's when you compare the group to the controls that you can see it. And the same study was done in pandas by the same investigator. Um, and it looked like the putamen, caudate, and globus pallidus was slightly larger than uh, the controls. And this study goes along with that finding. Um, this, is, um, this research is led by Chris Pittenger at Yale, where he showed that patients with pandas have antibodies to the, the uh, brain cells within the basal ganglia, so the striatal cholinergic interneurons, and that binding um, the, the, they found um, that binding of the antibodies uh, reduced signaling 
um, in these cells. And they also had electrophysiologic data that supported that these cholinergic interneurons were less responsive. And we did a study also showing um, some changes in the basal ganglia. We used DWI and saw microstructural changes really throughout the brains of these children, but most prominently in the basal ganglia. So these are the criteria um, developed by Sue Suido um, from the NIMH, um, Jim Lechman at Yale, and, Rose Hop and Ro Dr. Rose at Hopkins. Um, sort of the, the clinical or actually initially research criteria um, for PANS, which is sudden onset OCD or eating restriction, um, accompanied by at least two other comorbid symptoms. But from our experience, most patients have five or six comorbid symptoms and it sort of all starts suddenly. So anxiety, sensory dysregulation or motor abnormalities, behavior regression, deterioration in cognitive functioning, um, emotional lability, so just like the um, Sinham's Korea patients, um, new onset urinary symptoms and sleep disturbances. Um, so these are the kids in our clinic. When I put this slide together a few years ago, you know, we followed some kids that had had a single episode, but most of these kids are now in this relapsing and remitting. So we really think of PANS as a relapsing and remitting condition where the kids have an exacerbation of their psychiatric symptoms. And then either through treatment and, and sometimes on their own um, with that average duration of three months, will return to uh, their prior baseline. Um, Sometimes they do actually often, especially after you know two or three episodes, they will have residual symptoms. So some residual OCD anxiety, cognitive problems, um, and then have another relapse. Um, after about four or five episodes, especially if they're untreated, we do tend to see um, that the condition becomes more chronic. Um, so this is sort of the prevalence of all the different um, psychiatric problems we see in kids with PANS. Um, as you can see, most of the kids have most of these problems. So it's a very impairing disorder. Urinary changes are not as common. It affects 66% of the patients um, and they'll have sudden onset polyuria or new onset enuresis. So bedwetting or wetting their pants during the day, during the flare. Um, and sleep issues are very common at the onset of a flare. The sleep issues are varied. Insomnia, nightmares are very common, restless sleep, reverse cycling. But this is a unique finding, REM motor disinhibition. So these kids um, move during REM sleep. So in REM sleep, um, humans are supposed to be paralyzed, um, but these kids are moving during their REM sleep. This was found in, actually there's a third study now that has described this finding. Um, it's also a predictor of Parkinson's disease, which is another basal ganglia disorder. We don't necessarily think these kids are gonna develop Parkinson's disease, um, but it's not surprising um, that it's, it's related to another basal ganglia disorder. And like in Parkinson's disease, patients with PANS during a, a PANS episode will have deterioration in their handwriting. These are some of the nonspecific inflammatory um, signs that we see on physical exam. Um, so we can commonly see um, petechiae at the roof of the child's mouth um, at the, if, it's, if we evaluate the kid right at the beginning of a relapse. Um, Petechiae on the roof of the mouth is strongly associated with strep, but when we did a study, we actually found that very few of the kids that presented with petechiae to our clinic um, actually had a positive strep test. So it's either some other organism or we're missing the strep infection. Um, so that's something you should look at if you have a newly deteriorated um, patient. Um, we see this periungual redness, um, in some of our patients, we tend generally see this more in kids that have chronic symptoms, um, especially um, we're suspicious that this is like a chronic untreated strep infection that leads to this. 
Um, we can also see um, this thing called Terry's nails. We This is, you know, a sort of a prominent example. We usually see a thinner dark red band and that paling in the central part. Again, we see this more in the chronic kids. And this is Levito reticularis. Um, again, it's a very nonspecific finding, but um, I suspect it is a sign of inflammation. Um, so in our cohort, um, we have seen a lot of kids develop arthritis over time. Um, so this vertical line is the average age of diagnosis of PANS. Um, and the blue line is um, the first time to joint pain. And the red line is the time to diagnosis of arthritis. So, so delayed. Um, and in fact, it's delayed by, I think, let's see. So the average age of PANS onset in this cohort was 8.6 years. Median time to first joint pain was 19 years. And the time to diagnosis was 2.6 years after the onset of pain. So despite us, um, you know, sort of looking for rheumatologic signs that we were often missing the arthritis. Um, so now since we've, you know, discovered that this high rate of this arthritis in kids with PANS, um, we've started uh, looking more systematically using um, joint ultrasounds. Unfortunately, joint ultrasounds are not available at most children's hospitals, but we do have someone at Stanford. Um, and what we've seen is that these kids often have capsular thickening, um, which is a unique finding in children. It's actually never been described in kids, um, but it has been described in adults with psoriatic arthritis. So we suspect that there's a relationship to psoriatic arthritis. And as you recall, what I um, shared with you earlier is psoriatic arthritis can present with minimal uh, or virtually no swelling. It's a dry arthritis and very difficult to detect. And oftentimes people will have the arthritis for many years before it's diagnosed. So we're often asking about a family history of psoriasis to give us a clue. And because psychiatric symptoms, as I mentioned earlier, can distract from the child complaining of pain, um, you know, we really ask the families to observe the child when they get out of bed. Do they walk gingerly? Do they walk like an old man? Do they seem stiff when they've been sitting still for a while? And again, we have a very throw, a low threshold for getting ultrasounds. 20% uh, of our cohort um, develop some other autoimmune disease, um, even beyond arthritis. So again, this is the average age of PANS diagnosis. And this is over time children developing other autoimmune diseases in our PANS cohort. The most common is thyroiditis, um, psoriasis, celiac disease, Bichette's lupus. We also have a couple of cases of inflammatory bowel disease and a smattering of others. And this is not surprising. Um, where PANS is really the most prominent symptom being OCD, um, there's been a number of uh, epidemiologic studies linking OCD um, to familial autoimmune diseases. So this um, is our evaluation guidelines uh, for PANS. Um, right now, uh, you know, regressive autism um, is classified separately from PANS, and that's more for research purposes, right? Because we don't know what are the causes of regressive autism, nor do we know the causes of PANS. So they're being uh, studied separately. But like most you know, diseases, there's a, there is overlap. Um, so if there's a child with autism who suddenly develops explosive onset OCD and a lot of other psychiatric symptoms, um, it, it might be worth looking at the PANS um, sort of evaluation guidelines and you know, see if there's anything there that can help you understand your patient or your child. This is how we manage PANS. Um, I don't know what is the current um, sort of standard of care for managing regressive autism, but um, this is what we do in PANS. So first of all, we look for group A strep, considering the big overlap between uh, strep and OCD. Um, we look for, you know, we, we swab the child. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard because, you know, if the child has enlarged tonsils, strep could be deep within the tonsil and you might miss it. So we just are aware of the fact that if the, the tonsils are large, 
um, we may be missing a deeper infection. We also look for impetigo, we look for perianal strep, we look for other skin infections. Um, we also look for sinus infections, ear infections, toe infections. We've even had kids that presented to the ER with sudden onset OCD that had um, buttocks, uh, buttock abscesses. So really the first thing we do when we have a, a, a fresh case of a child with explosive onset OCD and psychiatric symptoms is we look for infections. Mycoplasma, um, there's a lot of false positive mycoplasma tests. The Mayo Clinic runs a test that's more specific. And since mycoplasma can cause basal ganglia encephalitis, it can look a lot like pans, pandas, or maybe it's the same thing, we don't know. So we do look for mycoplasma. Um, we haven't had very many cases of Lyme, um, but I've been in touch with a, a researcher at Columbia and he feels that um, he's had a number of uh, kids, not a large number, but a, a handful of kids with um, Lyme um, associated um, what he thinks is PANS. We've had one case in our clinic. And viruses can theoretically cause a deterioration. Um, you know, as everyone knows now, COVID associated um, psychiatric deteriorations, um, primarily psychosis is, is being studied. It looks different than PANS. Um, we're not as suspicious as for viruses. However, we do see um, a number of kids who've had their onset of PANS after flu. So in there, there may be some overlap with some antigens on flu and strep. So flu is something that we do see, but other viruses may be less common. But regardless, we don't have um, great treatments for viruses, so we let them run their course and we treat the post-infectious inflammatory disorder. But in a kid, with PANS, um, since we've seen deteriorations after flu, we make parents aware of this. And if the child develops a flu-like illness, we have them swabbed for flu, and then we treat with the standard of care um, for um, flu, um, which, which can be antivirals. Um, so the post-infectious inflammation um, is we often treat with steroids. If you catch a kid right at the beginning of a deterioration, within a few days, a five-day oral steroid burst can be very helpful. Um, we have a subset of kids that respond very well to NSAIDs. Um, it's less clear whether IVIG is helpful, but there's a, a current trial being launched to look at that. Um, definitely in some cases, IVIG has seemed helpful, but we've had many cases where it didn't seem to be helpful. Um, and this is where we really look for signs of underlying autoimmunity, because if we see that they have something underlying celiac disease or arthritis, really applying the standard of care for their underlying autoimmune disease can be very helpful in getting the kid back to a, a good baseline. And then of course, treating the, the psychiatric symptoms. So, you know, really the standard of care um, for OCD being CBT, um, the SSRIs and antipsychotics in our PANS kids um, can be helpful, but have to be used judiciously. Um, usually we treat the infection um, and then we give immune modulation and then we titrate in um, the psychiatric meds. Um, and after the inflammatory phase is over, these kids really do respond very well to SSRIs. Um, we often use clonidine and guanfacine, sometimes lithium and gabapentin when they have pain. So this is just some of our retrospective data on steroids. This is new onset PANS, um, where a steroid burst can reduce the number of weeks in a PANS episode, um, but even 10 weeks of symptoms is, is very hard on these kids. So this is where we looked at 318 relapses um, that were untreated and 85 that were treated with a five-day steroid burst early in the flare. And we, again, see a reduction in the number of weeks. So this is, you know, how asthma is treated. Um, so even though we know infections trigger asthma exacerbations, we still treat the inflammatory component of asthma with steroid bursts. Um, and then our data on NSAIDs. NSAIDs don't seem to be as impactful um, as the steroid bursts, um, but we do still see some impact. And especially if you're in, you know, treating an infection, right? If the kid has a sinus infection or ear infection, you don't want to necessarily be, get, being, be giving steroids right at the time of the infection. 
So we'll often treat the infection along with giving NSAIDs. And then as the kid um, recovers from their infection, we may give a steroid burst. So this is our model of how we think of PANS. Um, we think that infections, we, you know, I put COVID here, but I'm not sure that COVID triggers a PANS-like illness, but it, it triggers other psychiatric stuff. Um, but anyways, you see a, an infection and then, in, and clearly these infections occur in all people, right? And not everyone has a psychiatric deterioration. So there is some immune predisposition. We have found a particular HLA that seems to be associated with PANS and a cure association. Um, and I suspect that's true for the spectrum of different inflammatory um, brain diseases. We also see complement being involved, just like in lupus. I'm gonna show you some data on the innate immune system. So complement's part of the innate immune system, but also cells like monocytes are part of the innate, innate immune system. And I'll show you how they're involved. Um, we also see some adaptive immune system changes that look like other autoimmune diseases, lupus and, our, and rheumatoid arthritis, where memory B cells um, are less than the age match population. And uh, um, I'm sorry, the memory B cells are, are more than the age population, the age match population, and the naive cells are less. Um, and there's been some, a stu there was one study in Italy suggesting that the microbiome is involved and we have metabolomics data suggesting that the microbiome is involved as well. Um, so this is, and I know this is a big um, component of what people are thinking is going on with some of the autism kids. So um, this is sort of what we think sets up the immune, the immune predisposition. And then after the big inflammatory event, you get disruption of the blood-brain barrier, and this is how antibodies, cytokines, and other immune mediators get into the brain. We suspect there's some blood vessel inflammation in kids with PANS and related disorders. Um, I didn't show you the data on microglial activation, but that's um, but also been being studied in PANS and OCD. Um, and then altered neuronal signaling, which is, which is being shown in animal models of PANS. And then with all of this going on, that's how you get the PANS phenotype. So this is our monocyte data, which we're just about to publish. Um, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but what we see in a kid in an acute episode of PANS is we see elevated inflammatory brain homing monocytes. So these are, monocyte, these are cells produced by the bone marrow that home to the brain. And we do see them in the cerebral spinal fluid of the kids that we were able to do lumbar punctures on. But then this inflammatory brain homing monocyte um, is basically disappears when they're in remission. However, um, when they're um, flaring, uh, they don't have these repairing brain monocytes in their bloodstream. And we suspect that it's, they're going to the brain. Um, and, and we do see these repairing monocytes in the CSF um, of flaring PANS patients. And what we suspect, and then they go up um, when they're in remission. So we think that these cells are there to help the brain recover from these PANS episodes. So we think these are good cells. And you know, the goal of our research eventually is to see how we can augment um, the conversion of the inflammatory monocyte profile into a repairing monocyte to help these kids, these kids speed to recovery um, more quickly. And this uh, work is done in uh, Be Dr. Betsy Mellon's lab by her postdoc, uh, Shama. So our, my take home points today um, are that post-infectious inflammatory disorders um, and autoimmune disorders are strongly associated with psychiatric symptoms. And the psychiatric symptoms, especially in the case of PANS, can precede the full presentation of these inflammatory conditions. And you know that kind of goes back to that graph I was showing you where the arthritis is manifesting later and the other autoimmune diseases, thyroiditis, type one diabetes, all are showing up later after the behavior change. And it could be that the process is starting at the time of the behavior change, but you don't really appreciate the disease until the tissue has really been broken down. Um, so I hope that in the future we can start looking for these inflammatory conditions earlier on at the, at the time of the initial behavior change. There's direct and indirect evidence that some of these psychiatric conditions are mediated by inflammation. 
Um, the inflammatory diseases are treatable um, and often curable. And, and my suspicion is, you, you know, we haven't done a systemic systematic study on this yet, but that the psychiatric symptoms from our experience improve when the inflammatory disease improves. And in, um, inflammation um, can cause injury to tissues. So the rehabilitation um, of the child after a PANS episode or after a deterioration is really important. Um, and even though maybe during the acute inflammatory phase, the psychiatric medications may backfire. Um, we have a lot of kids that do very poorly um, on SSRIs and antipsychotics, but later on, um, they can be a cornerstone to treatment and recovery. So, so just because a child doesn't do well on a psych med during the initial phases of a deterioration doesn't mean you can't go back to it at a later phase. Um, so in addition to psychiatric symptoms, very young children have new onset, pretty significant behavior disturbances, um, motor signs, sensory um, and sleep disturbances, urinary symptoms, and um, also cognitive issues. We see them suddenly start having problems with math and reading. Um, so be aware of these things. Um, I'd like to thank um, all the clinicians that work in our immune behavioral health clinic, especially Dr. Um, uh, Willett, who's now the clinic director, and Margot Tienemann, who leads the psychiatry services, and my uh, nurse practitioner who's been with me for a long time, Bahari. Um, we have a new rheumatologist in our clinic, May Ma, and uh, Dr. Silverman's a lovely psychiatrist. We also have an immunologist in our clinic because a lot of these kids eventually develop immune deficiencies or have exacerbations with things like um, seasonal allergies. So he helps us manage that component. And Dr. Z, who recently joined our clinic as a psychiatrist. Um, and this is our um, clinic research team, um, including Jackie, who's with us here today, who's our program manager. Um, and our clinical research team uh, basically is in charge of distributing, uh, distributing uh, patient questionnaires and um, cataloging uh, data and tying data to our uh, biospecimens. So we're collecting research specimens on all of our patients um, in flare and remission and those with chronic symptoms. And we're sharing these research specimens with a number of basic science labs. Um, so I wanna thank um, our partners, um, our basic science partners for helping us um, study PANS, especially Betsy Mellons who leads and, and Holden Maker. Holden's their director of the Human Immune Monitoring Corps. Um, and Dr. Mellons has been a prominent um, researcher in rheumatologic diseases for decades. And both of them uh, co-lead our basic science uh, program on, for PANS. And then we also have collaborations outside of Stanford. Um, Jill Hollenbach is doing our HLA and CURE work. Um, Narisha is looking at T cell repertoires. We're collaborating with Juliet to develop a microbiome project. Um, Carlos Bustamante, who's helping with the informatics, as well as a number of other people who are helping us. And Madeline Cunningham, I just want to point out, who's a very good um, Sinham's Korea acute medic fever researcher and has provided a lot of insights into pandas and pans. And Richard Fry, who's teaching me a little bit about autism and autism regressions, and we're hoping we're gonna, going to be studying brain homing monocytes in, in some of the patients he's um, following who have regressive autism. Um, and this is um, all the other centers um, that have now a PANS um, clinic or research program. So we started our program about 10 years ago and we were alone in the effort. And so we're very grateful that other centers have joined us. Um, and here's our website. We try to post um, PANS related articles as well as our um, evaluation and treatment guidelines on our website. So if you're looking for more information, please visit our website um, publications tab. And that's all I have today. Looks like we have a number of questions. So I'm going to start um, here. So the first question, I, I won't say any names because I don't think I'm supposed to, but I'll just um, say that, let's see, how Okay, so someone is asking about, can Sydenham's chorea also present during 
and after puberty. So generally we think of it as childhood onset, um, but as you saw from my lecture, there can be some more subtle presentations, right? And so it could be um, that there's earlier episodes that maybe were missed and the kid just looked like they had sort of a behavior change and they looked restless and no one actually um, evaluated them for Korea. But I would say most cases present in childhood. Um, we have had a, f uh, we, we did have a case of a teenager where the pediatrician thought it was the first episode. And then when we looked back in the records, we did see that the child had had some concerning symptoms earlier. So I would look through your records and see if there were episodes earlier. If it's a brand new movement disorder um, presenting in the teenage years or adult years, I would think more of the classic autoimmune encephalitis like NMDA receptor encephalitis. So the next one is Sinham's Korea rule out for pandas. Yeah, you know, even though um, I think Dr. Suido um, sort of came up with a hypothesis for pandas being a form thrust of um, Sinham's Korea, since pandas and pans is still controversial, provisional, um, you know, that's why we say, you know, if your child meets the uh, or patient meets the strict criteria for Sinham's, well, there's no like clear criteria for Sinham's Korea, but if they look more like Sinham's Korea, just call it Sinham's Korea. Um, so in our patient population, um, you know, for the purposes of working with insurance companies, if the kid has any form of Korea, and that includes tongue fasciculations or milkmaid grip, we'll just call it Sinham's Korea. Um, and that just makes it easier to get, get treatments. Um, what do we do with um, kids, autism kids who are nonverbal and cannot express any type of pain? I'm so glad um, that Barbara asked this question because um, I agree. I think that's a big problem. And I remember um, in when I was doing general rheumatology clinic and we would get these kids, you know, with autism, and it was really like just the mom's intuition that something had changed. And, and I think that we just as clinicians have to have a lower threshold of um, thinking about working these kids up with um, objective imaging because we can't rely on them to describe the pain. Um, and, and we even see this in our kids with PAMS that, that their irritability or the OCD or even the you know delusions, everything is just so much more prominent than you know pain and stiffness, <laughs> right? That that it's it's the least of their worries. Um, so we so again, just have a low threshold for looking um, with imaging and observing the child and see how they move. Um, you know, right when they get out of bed in the morning and after they've been sitting still for a long period of time. Um, so then the question is, do I consult with professionals outside the state? So I don't have a license outside of California. And right now we're not set up to do formal consultations um, outside of our state, um, but it is something that we're looking into. Um, so let's see, I think I, here, what is the correlation between autism and PANS? Isn't there a high incidence of PANS in autism community? So um, it's all how you define it. So I consider Richard Fry sort of more of an, much more of an autism expert than I do. And he classifies it more like a, a deterioration in autism, a regressive autism. Um, and he doesn't call it autism with a PANS deterioration. And it, it doesn't matter what you call it. Um, I think that even he will use the same approach in working up a kid with regressive autism as we use in our PANS clinic, right? Looking for underlying inflammation as well as other metabolic um, issues. Um, so eventually, you know, with Richard Fry and others studying regressive autism and us studying um, mechanisms involved in PANS, I hope that these research fields, and I believe that these research fields will inform um, each other. Um, so right now they're being studied separately, but I think you know when a clinician has a patient, we 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 sort of look at the patient as opposed to the label of pans or autism. In our clinic, since we don't have an autism specialist, we we don't see kids with autism. Um, 
But, you know, like I said, we're trying to collaborate with experts like Richard Fry so that we can, you know, better learn um, about the mechanisms underlying these, these deteriorations. Um, so a message from um, a mother who said, my son had a mental deterioration after having tonsillitis. Until then, he was a normal child. So he was normal for up to three years of age. He spoke, ate well, and was sociable. What exams should I do now um, to alleviate symptoms? So he doesn't speak, doesn't eat, and is no longer sociable. Um, the only place where there is constant is a, okay, so it sounds like he has a lesion on his um, buttock region. Um, so I don't know how old the kid is now, um, but um, I think that it's, you know, it's worth looking um, for, you know, underlying infections and inflammatory diseases. It's it's hard when you have an older kid who had a deterioration really young in life because it's it's I, I you know we struggle with knowing how to how to work up um, that situation um, because with each episode there is probably brain injury and I don't know if you can sort of go back in time and un, undo that. Um, so an, an anonymous attendee, my autistic son goes through bouts of severe OCD, especially when he gets sick or is fighting off an illness. He has, uh, and he has some seizure activity. Is there anything we can do to help identify the OCD versus autism versus seizures versus other things like lupus or pans and figure out how to help? Um, it's a game of whack-a-mole. If we could concretely diagnose some of these other factors, maybe we'd have more things to try. So I would, I, I think this is hard. I, I don't know what to do about this case, but I know in our cases, we, we try to evaluate the kid and look at a spectrum of immune markers when the kid is in a flare or a worsened state and compare it to how they are when they're better. Um, and if we see particular markers fluctuating with their state, then we can use that to inform sort of more investigations and treatments. But quite honestly, it's even in our clinic where, you know, we're researching this illness and this PANS illness. Um, and we have a lot of clinicians sort of dedicated in looking. A lot of times we don't know either, right? We don't know what the infection was that caused the deterioration. And we can't find, um, you know, some underlying inflammatory disorder. And it's, it's really hard because if we can't find anything, we don't know what to treat. And, you know, my heart goes out to all of the families that are, you know, struggling with a child who has deteriorated because there's just unfortunately not enough answers out there. And we, we definitely need to do more research to understand what's causing these deteriorations. Um, so the next question is, um, what type of strep is involved in these studies? So all of the research studies I mentioned, it's group A strep. So it's kind of the common cause of strep pharyngitis. Um, and the next one, my son has linear morphia and autism and his mental health is declining. What is my next step? What should I ask the rheumatologist to do? Um, well, I would treat the linear morphia, you know, aggressively and, you know, using the standard of care, because if there's a relationship between the underlying autoimmune disease and, and the worsening autism, um, then sort of using the tools to treat the linear morphia um, is um, helpful. And, you know, I think linear morphia is, you know, again, like one of the other, <laughs> one of the many autoimmune inflammatory diseases that we're still learning about. Um, so maybe even seeing a center that specializes in linear morphia in case they have new tools or treatments that can be helpful. Um, what causes PANS and what is the treatment for it? Well, I, I don't know <laughs> what causes PANS. <laughs> um, we are definitely investigating, um, and I suspect that there's a, a multitude of things that contribute to the cause of PANS. Um, on our website, um, and here I can share that with you again, um, we do, um, let's see here, share screen. Okay. 
So here's our website, med.stanford.edu backslash PANS. We do, um, on the very top, on, under the publication page, I think it's the first section uh, is where we post our evaluation and treatment guidelines. And, you know, they're not guidelines, they're suggestions. Um, there's so much we don't understand about PANS. And, you know, honestly, like I said, we're struggling with a lot of the patients in our clinic um, because we don't know what's driving um, the disease. Um, so the our consensus evaluation, um, you know, sort of papers on um, and our treatment papers are really our best guess on what what things that can be tried. Um, I think the biggest challenge is finding a clinician that's willing to try things. Um, so, um, but I hope that some of these um, papers can be helpful to you. Uh, the next question is, how can you tell if a family member is a strep carrier? Also, would someone have to swab a positive for strep throat or can strep be carried in other areas of the body? I'm so glad that Melanie asked this because I should have mentioned it. Yes, so the places that strep can harbor, I mean, the most common place is the oral pharynx, so the back of the throat. Um, but as I mentioned, if the tonsils are large, maybe it's not on the surface, but it can be deeper down. Um, so in a kid with large tonsils and they are, are, have pans, um, because of the link between strep and OCD, we often um, suggest the tonsils come out. Um, and we've had some families where a sibling had large tonsils, and we did worry that that was the, the source of strep, but you know, we can't say for sure. Um, the other places that strep can be you know, in um, abscesses, it can be in the sinuses. Um, it's rare, um, but it can be. Um, so if there's sinus symptoms, you can think about that. But the standard of treatment, the standard of um, care for treatment of sinusitis um, is augmentin, and that would treat strep in the sinuses. Um, strep can also be in the vaginal region. So if a child or a sibling um, has, you know, chronic itching um, or a discharge, um, a vaginal discharge, then um, that, that area can be swabbed for strep. Younger kids can get perianal strep. Um, so swabbing for that can be very difficult to get rid of. So thanks, Melanie, for asking that question. And we do, every time a child deteriorates in our clinic, we do swab all the family members and we ask about these other regions, the vaginal regions and the perianal region and, and the, the siblings and parents. Um, so the next question, my son hit all his developmental milestones um, by about age four. We noted some issues at preschool with not socializing with other students. Kindergarten experience was the same. I'm wondering if testing for PANS is possible. He has been diagnosed with autism, but could we be dealing with PANS? So PANS is usually an abrupt deterioration. Um, so I'm not sure that it would be helpful um, in a kid with, with sort of social um, issues. Um, I think if, if a kid with autism suddenly deteriorates or suddenly develops, you know, explosive onset OCD, then I would consider sort of looking closer at PANS. Um, so then another question by um, Melanie, how common is it for individuals, for an individual who is diagnosed with autism and PANDAS as a child to still exhibit PANDAS episodes as an adult? Um, so when we think about a pandas episode, so sometimes people think that, um, and not saying that Melanie thinks this, but this is more of an aside, that if a kid has, you know, sort of a tantrum, that that's a pandas episode. So we don't think of it that way. We think of pans, pandas episodes is kind of like a three month deterioration often preceded by an infection. Um, so can you see those um, sort of, regressive episodes or um, relapses, you know, through the later years of childhood and into adulthood? And my answer is yes, I do think it goes down by quite a bit. I mean, it seems like our younger kids have more relapses as they get into high school and colleges, they college, they have less relapses. 
Um, but we definitely see kids where they're in a nice remission, remission all through high school, then they go off and live in the dorms in college. Um, and lo and behold, their girlfriend has strep and then they get strep and then they have a sudden, you know, worsening or sudden onset recurrence of um, severe OCD and other symptoms. Um, so we know that, and we suspect that that um, predisposition um, continues through, um, you know, through the lifespan of, of the patient. So the next question by Barbara, um, what do we do with medical professionals who do not recognize PANs and PANDAs and will not offer treatment, for example, sick kids in hospitals? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, <laughs> even at Stanford, we have a lot of non-believers and which is why we don't, we often um, don't admit our children to the ward. And, you know, our program is primarily managing kids, you know, as an outpatient with, you know, we don't do IVIG that much, um, but, you know, sometimes we give IVIG in the home, but we certainly give other immune modulators. But, you know, for the most part, we can't rely on hospitals um, and staff to recognize this. Um, you know, among the basic scientists studying PANS, PANDAS, I think that anyone that sees the basic science data, um, they are very convinced it's an inflammatory disorder. Um, it's harder to convince clinicians, um, especially since there seems to be about three or four um, very vocal um, neurologists that are against the um, sort of entity of PANS and PANDAS. Um, and I just, I don't have a solution and, you know, I feel terrible for all those children out there that aren't getting um, care. I think there are growing numbers of centers um, that do recognize it, um, but those centers cannot possibly keep up with the demand. So most centers are only seeing kids within their catchment area. Um, it's a big, this is a big, uh, a, you know, problem with our, our system right now and with the fact that there's, you know, not NIH funding for researching PANS PANDAS. There's very few people researching it. Um, so I'm, I, don't, I don't have a great answer for you, um, Barbara. I'm very sorry. Uh, the next question, um, how does a primary care physician do screening tests um, and gain appreciation that is needed? Um, well, we tried, you know, it's, it's true, like as, you know, in our clinic where we have, you know, two rheumatologists and immunologists that, you know, are used to dealing with inflammatory diseases, it's quite easy for us to order, um, labs. But I think for a primary care doctor, it would be less comfortable for them to order labs because what they don't, you know, sort of know what to do with the results. Um, and even our clinic doesn't always know what to do with the results, right? We do a sort of a broad look at how the immune system is functioning and do our best to guess at what um, treatments will help the child, but we don't have definitive answers. And I think that's very uncomfortable for primary care physicians. I think there are a number of pediatricians, and I see uh, David Traver is watching today, and he's an example of a pediatrician who has decided he's going to, going to specialize in autism and has made himself a PANS expert and is learning how to, and he, in fact, he knows a lot more about autism deteriorations than, than I do. Um, so I think just finding someone that cares about this patient population of kids with autism or kids with sudden neuropsych deteriorations and but it, it may be outside the scope of many primary care doctors. Um, I think you can rely on the primary care doctor to look for things like strep and mycoplasma and treat sinusitis. And, um, you know, immunologists are willing to, you know, do what it takes to get a kid's allergies under control. We've had a lot of kids, you know, deteriorate every spring. And when, you know, they've worked with our immunologist to get their allergies under control, then they have less sinus infections and that can really improve their baseline. So really trying to find the experts or kids with abdominal symptoms in IBD and autism, right? Really relying on your subspecialists to understand the underlying sort of inflammatory disease. But it is a tough situation for families right now.
Um, next question, what dosing and duration of steroids do you use with PANS and PANDAS flares? Okay, that's a great question. So there's, there's two, well, actually there's four protocols we use. And under our treatment guidelines, I think it's Appendix B. I go through all the different steroid dosing regimens. So you can, everyone has access to those. You can go to our website. Um, you can pull up the paper and go to Appendix B and it, it'll outline them. And so it depends on the severity of the flare and where in the flare um, you are. So when we're following a kid and he's you know, at a good baseline and then he gets strep or he gets an infection and he suddenly deteriorates, as soon as we treat the infection, we start a five-day steroid burst. Um, if they're not already getting better with just the NSAIDs and the treatment of the infection alone. Um, and, and it's just the standard dosing that you would use in asthma, one to two milligrams per kilogram. Um, and, um, and sometimes that gets a kid back to like 80% of their baseline, we'll give another steroid burst, they'll get back to 90% of their baseline, another steroid burst, and they're back to normal. So sometimes it takes a few bursts. But if a kid is sort of, you know, weeks into their flare or months, um, or and it's particularly severe, um, sometimes we'll do the same approach that's used in Sydenham's Korea, which is one to two milligrams per kilogram for up to 60 milligrams a day, um, or in sometimes 60 milligrams twice a day for, you know, three to four weeks, and then taper over four weeks. And that is described in the Appendix B of the treatment guidelines as well. A lot of kids don't tolerate the oral steroids or they'll get worse, like they'll act more irritable or more aggressive or more OCD, and that's not surprising. But we don't necessarily give up on the steroids because the kid is worse on oral steroids. We'll switch to IV steroids. And we have our IV methylprednisolone um, protocol also listed in Appendix B. And sometimes, you know, three IV doses in a row of methylprednisolone can really pop a kid out of their episode. But sometimes we have to continue that regimen monthly for six months to a year. Um, so it just depends on the kid. We've also used steroid, uh, we've used um, oral decadron um, using a similar protocol than what's been what's used in multiple sclerosis. Um, and that dosing protocol is also included in Appendix B. Um, so I hope that can be helpful to the clinicians. And then, sorry, David, I commented on you and then I forgot to answer your questions. So you asked about our experience using LDN for pain in a PANS kid. And yes, we have used LDN pretty successfully um, in a handful of our kids with PANS who have pain. Um, so in, you know, it could be helpful for other things in PANS. We don't have a ton of experience with it, um, but when we're sort of at the end of the line and, and nothing else seems to be working, we'll often try it. Um, the important thing is, I'm sure Dr. Traver knows, is um, in what I've learned from um, my colleagues in alternative medicine is you have to start at a low dose, like one milligram, and then you can gradually, like over many weeks, work up to four or five milligrams. Um, we usually give it at night. Um, and it can, I've seen it cause irritability in some kids. Um, so, you know, really paying attention. And this is where it's hard with a lot of these disorders is you can only make one change at a time, right? And so once we've sort of decided that we're gonna try LDN, we try to keep that variable alone. And if, you know, sometimes the magic dose is three milligrams and you go to four milligrams and the kid is more irritable. Um, so being kind of careful to cha only change one thing at a time. Um, and then Adrian asks, what dosing and duration of steroids do you use with, oh, I, I already explained that one. So that's Appendix B in the treatment guidelines. And then another question. Um, oh, okay. So I think this page, this person is describing their child's symptoms. Um, uh, and so this is the kid that might have a sore in his buttock region and he had um, a sudden deterioration at age three and she's describing the symptoms as anxiety, behavior, 
developmental regression, emotional ability, depression, irritability, oppositional behavior, deterioration in school, sensory abnormalities. Um, polyar. So, so it does sound like <laughs> that particular kid, um, you know, has all the PAN symptoms. I didn't see OCD in there, but um, all the other ones are. And she mentions that the child has a limp. So if the child has a limp, I think it is worth bringing the child to a rheumatologist. And, um, you know, especially if the limp seems worse in the morning or when he's been uh, stationary for a period of time, um, and, and see if he has arthritis. And again, it might require some imaging. Um, and then, oh, Aspire. Oh, this is a great uh, website. So Betsy Calhoun um, uh, has um, listed the website for Aspire. Um, and they have a list, uh, I think they have a list of um, practitioners um, who are helpful. Um, so thanks, Betsy. Um, let's see, so the next one, children who are very responsive to IVIG, symptoms totally resolve, but if not given every four weeks, they have breakthrough symptoms. Is the best course to continue IVIG indefinitely or is there another tier to put them into remission? So that is a great question. Um, I don't know the answer to that and we've tried various things. We've tried in some kids to just keep them on IVIG for two or three years and you know, in the kids with PANS, so they had, they were, had um, normal development and then suddenly developed PANS. Um, we have gotten, um, I think all of our kids who are on chronic IVIG often they're doing well. So it's possible to come off of it. Um, in some kids where we found underlying arthritis or some other autoimmune disease, adding in another immune modulator had been has been helpful in getting, out, getting us um, to be able to get the kid off of IVIG. Um, we've also added IV steroids in with IVIG in order to um, um, get a better remission and, and get the kids off of treatment. So you might want to consider those things. And then a question by Michelle. Um, so Denise, am I going too long? Should I keep answering these questions or because I know we're over? We are over. If you have time, I'm yeah. sure everyone's delighted to have you stay on, but it's whatever works best for you really. Yes, I can, um, I can definitely keep going. Um, yeah, okay, so, so another um, pa pa family is asking about their child who had what they seem, they seem to think is PANS and they're looking for treatment. So I, again, would go to the PANS Physician Network um, or the PANDAS Network um, or Aspire. Um, web page and um, a lot of those organizations have listed clinicians who are willing to treat pans pandas. Um, so are there certain infections which might cause a child to have a cognitive decline? So slow processing, poor working memory, speech and language issues. My son has had, my had mycoplasma when he was two, he is now 14 lots of ear infections, and then Kawasaki's disease when he was five. He waxed and waned for years and is now in a chronic state and almost looks like he's um, turning autistic. Are there kids that present this way? I would suspect that there's a, a lot of kids that present this way. Um, I don't know what to do with the kids with chronic symptoms because I don't know if that's injury or if that's ongoing inflammation. So I think what we would do is we would look for signs of underlying inflammation, knowing that our tools are um, very limited. Um, sometimes you might find a clinician that's willing to try something like IV steroids. IV steroids is the absolute best I mean, if you do the, you know, in an adult size person, it would be a thousand milligrams of methylprednisolone. You know, it's the best test as to whether or not there's underlying inflammation. If the, if a kid suddenly improves, then maybe you are dealing with an inflammatory, an ongoing inflammatory disease. I guess theoretically, steroids also cause metabolic changes, 
Um, so you don't want to over interpret improvement. Um, but if you, you know, sort of had a clinical marker that improved, and then when the child gets worse, that marker gets worse, that could, you know, help you manage the disease. Um, and then, so Moa asks, I wonder about bacteria Moraxella catalaris, catalaris because our son gets sick in his pans if he gets that bacteria. Why is he reacting to that bacteria? Um, I don't know. So I think Moraxella is, um, uh, can cause things like sinusitis um, and maybe ear infections. And, you know, again, I, I suspect um, that, you know, there's, you know, every person has a different immune predisposition and their vulnerability may be different. There seems to be this group that deteriorates with strep infections, another group that deteriorates with mycoplasma, or we think might deteriorate with mycoplasma. Um, and, you know, what are the other subgroups of patients that deteriorate with infections? Um, we, we just don't know. I mean, it's, um, but if you find that your child sort of has a deterioration in the setting of the same infection, um, then that would be a, a, an important clue. Um, can the pandemic help further prove the existence of PANS in the mainstream? Um, so yeah, I, I'm hopeful that people are more and more realizing that infections cause more than just the infection symptoms that it can trigger um, the, um, you know, it can trigger inflammatory disorders, including arthritis um, and psychiatric deteriorations. And so I'm hoping the medical community more and more is thinking about post-infectious um, sequelae, including neuropsychiatric deteriorations. Oh, and then neuroimmune. So I'm, I'm a huge fan. So another person has posted about the neuroimmune organization. I'm a big fan of the neuroimmune organization and I'd forgotten, but they do have a list of providers and um, their list indicates whether they have experience in treating neuroimmune disorders in kids with autism. I think they also talk about um, whether or not they have experience with PANS and whether or not they take insurance. So that's a very big um, sort of help, uh, the neuroimmune organization. Um, do children outgrow PANDAS? My child is in her early 20s, but now she did have a flare up in college. Should I consider us in the clear? But oh, she did have a, she did have a flare up in college. Um, yeah, so I I don't I think with a lot of these diseases, lupus, arthritis, you know, it doesn't matter what underlying autoimmune disease, I do think there's always a risk of a relapse. So just being aware of that, you know, hopefully, you know, a young adult will have more insights into their own mental health and when they see that their, you know, OCD is suddenly worsening that they can get you know, sort of worked up for things like strep or other infections or autoimmune disease. Um, but I, I, I think that the deteriorations definitely decrease in adulthood because the infectious exposures are less. Um, but I don't know that um, you're ever in the clear. The other thing that we do know is, is the blood-brain barrier is more leaky in kind of the early childhood years. So it's possible that we see sort of the most, you know, um, uh, serious, abrupt, severe appearing cases in early childhood, but those episodes may be less impactful um, as the child um, matures um, because the blood-brain barrier is a little tighter. Um, so, so it's, I do think, I, I, it does seem like the kids that relapse um, in college, they, they do seem to do pretty well, especially when they're um, treated early. Um, and then a person asks about exams for testing PANS. So there is no lab test to say that a child has PANS. Um, I hope that can be developed. Um, but for now, and you know, and I don't know if it will be developed quite honestly, because it may be a more nonspecific um, finding. Um, we might find biomarkers that go along with it. 
But right now, you know, it's a clinical diagnosis uh, based on the symptoms. Uh, there's a question, where in East Europe can we find help for our children's and pans? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think, you know, I, I don't know if there's any PANS organizations or autoimmune encephalitis organizations in Eastern Europe. Um, I know Italy has um, some programs and England, there are some programs. Um, I'm sure in other countries, there's a woman in Paris that's studying neuropsychiatric inflammatory diseases, um, but I don't know about East Europe, I'm sorry. Are you familiar with sensitivities to EMF? I'm not familiar with that, I'm sorry. Um, so feasible treatment options, um, one with mild ankylosing spondylitis, severe asthma, high functioning autism, ADHD, mild but resistant mixed depression, anxiety disorder. Um, well, I think if the child has um, ankylosing spondylitis, I would definitely um, address that. Um, and then the standard of care for asthma and anxiety and depression and ADHD. Um, NSAIDs can be very helpful for ankylosing spondylitis. And we've, um, as I mentioned earlier, have seen it um, seem to be helpful for some of the psychiatric symptoms in our PANS patients. So it might be worth um, um, thinking about NSAIDs with your doctor. Um, Let's see. So a uh, woman commented about um, their child doing uh, better with uh, GABA. And uh, I've heard this from other parents. Um, he also does well with ibuprofen to reduce flares. I'm just gonna quickly look at my calendar and make sure I'm not missing another meeting. I'm sorry. Nope, I'm doing okay. Um, what causes can warts cause a flare in our kids? I haven't heard of warts causing a flare, but warts can be, I've seen kids um, with a lot of warts improve after discovering their vitamin D was very low um, and then supplementing with vitamin D helped their warts. So low vitamin D can cause immune dysregulation and difficulty fighting things like viruses. So that could be something um, that you look into. Um, Let's see, do you re recommend IVIG long-term for treatment of PANS? We try, in our clinic, we try to get kids off of IVIG um, because it's, uh, you know, it is expensive, insurance doesn't always cover it. Um, and, um, and it's uncomfortable for kids, it can cause headaches and stuff. So we do try to get kids off of IVIG. Um, and I think we've been pretty successful in doing that. Um, and then somebody commented that Cooperstock has retired from the University of, Mon of Missouri. And yes, he was a very helpful infectious disease doctor that helped us draft our infectious disease um, treatment guidelines for PANS, but he is retired. Um, so someone asked about COVID affecting PANS. Um, symptoms seem to be very similar, but much more severe. So we have had a few kids in our PANS clinic get COVID and they did not have a PANS exacerbation, but they were also at a very good baseline. So I don't know, the University of Arizona psychiatrist um, is studying this and he seems to think that post-COVID neuropsych deteriorations look different than the typical PANS deterioration. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful. Um, so have you seen cases of PANS occur for the first time in adults as opposed to younger children? So generally, no. I think um, we have not had that experience. Um, in kids that have had, um, you know, sort of deterioration in their later years, when we've looked through their records, we actually found evidence that they had earlier deteriorations, but they were mild and they, they got over them. So how do PANS and PANDAS differ from AE? Well, I think most cases of AE in kids are seronegative and we don't know what causes AE. <laughs> um, and we don't know what causes PANS and PANDAS. So I don't think we can say how they differ in terms of the um, mechanisms, um, but we're just classifying them separately as a way to 
um, study them, um, you know, sort of in their a more homogenous way. So kids, the way we define, you know, pans pandas is abrupt onset OCD with all those comorbid symptoms. I mean, it's pretty rare for AE to present that way. Um, and typically AE will progress to seizures, whereas a kid with pans pandas, they can be an episode for many months and we typically don't see seizures. We have seen um, ESES, which is epilepsy that comes out at night in a few of our kids. Um, and we have seen EEG changes, but different than typical AE. Um, so here's another um, parent that says that their kid looked amazing on a five-day steroid burst, almost neurotypical. But when the steroid was gone, they were back to where they were. They attempted to do a month-long and we didn't see any changes, like the five-day burst. Why? Um, I don't know why. Uh, I'm. I guess I'd wonder whether the dosing was different. Um, but I. I can't say. I know that when oral steroids fail in our patient population, we often go to IV steroids. Um, uh, and then. Let's see, Blanca says, is amantadine commonly used during symptoms and diagnosis? So that's a great question. I know amantadine has been used in ADHD and has been used in autism. We have tried it in a couple of our kids with PANS who are sort of more at the chronic phase and out of the inflammatory phase. And we suspect that it was helpful, but you know, we wouldn't know unless there was a clinical trial. Um, but since it has been shown to be helpful in autism, it seems like it's worth, um, uh, you know, trying if your clinician is suggesting it. And then David Traver uh, mentions that he tries something transdermal, but I don't know what he's, he's referring to a prior um, conversation. So sorry, Dave, I don't know what, <laughs> what you're talking about with transdermal, so feel free to pipe in. Um, each time we notice a sudden onset of OCD and aggressive episodes, my son rarely swaps positive for strep, but the strep um, shows elevated titers, and they haven't had normal titers since he has, when blood was drawn, when he has been presenting as well. Could this tell us that strep is present in a different part of the body? Yeah, I would, I would wonder whether strep is deep in the tonsils or the sinuses. And then, um, you know, I guess if the ASO and DNAs B are still elevated when the kid is doing well, I don't know if that means whether or not um, strep is playing a role. I think in the um, infection guidelines for PANS, uh, Dr. Cooperstock did recommend, and I think a lot of the PANS clinicians um, in cases like this would try a three week course of Augmentin. Oh, okay, so Dave Trevor mentioned that LDN can be given transdermal. So I don't have um, experience with that, but thanks David for commenting on that. And then somebody asked about um, whether it's common in siblings. Um, so we do see a lot of sibling pairs have PANS or what we think is related neuropsychiatric deteriorations. Um, so I think, um, you know, we often ask about how the siblings are doing in our patients in our clinic.